Today we'll be talking about Roma, the idea of the auteur, and Mexican cinema. And what I wanted to do um, with this presentation is that I wanted to demystify some of these um, concepts and ideas and to give a little bit more of context so, um, so that we could um, get a better understanding of the film. The last time I lectured on Mexican cinema in college, I was also talking about another Alfonso Cuaron movie, Y tu mamá también. I feel like I've learned a lot and I'm very happy to share all of this that I've learned in, in those years. So in talking about demystifying Mexican cinema, we have to understand that Mexico has been mystified. And this is a process that has been going on for a long time, maybe since the um, conquest and maybe even before since Columbus. But I want to focus specifically on um, the mystification that happened after the Mexican Revolution. Um, so after the Mexican Revolution, Mexicans had been essentially killing each other for over 10 years. And it was necessary to unite all the citizens in a cohesive group. Um, and what this group ended up being was an ideology of mestizaje, which you may have covered in this class. And one of the most important tools of mestizaje was the arts. Um, so we have artists, musicians, theater people, dancers, architects, writers, fine artists, and filmmakers all gathering and hanging out in Mexico City and all the ideas and conversations that they shared resulted in a recognizable cohesive Mexican aesthetic, which is, I think, the aesthetic of mestizaje. And what I want to point out is that race and class in Mexico don't necessarily function the same way that they work as it works in the United States. It's not just black and white. You have all of these mixtures that happened specifically in the colonial period, and you end up with something, a web of relationships that is very complicated. And I think um, Sergio de la Mora alludes to this in, his, uh, in the essay that you read for this class, where he says, for Julia Colas, the term describes a situation where dark skin is associated with poverty and poverty with domestic work and domestic work with failure. And later on, he says, Mexico is not the mestizo nation it imagines itself to be. For Marcela Garcia, Mexico's caste system is omnipresent and we have not reckoned with it. And I think that that is very true. And all of these begins with the conversations that happened directly after the revolution. Um, because it was both citizens and foreigners, both European and United States citizens living and working in Mexico who participated in the creation of this aesthetic. So they were part of these conversations, but I think more important than who participated in the conversations is also who was excluded from these conversations. And that almost always is indigenous and poor people. And those are very intricate, intricately linked throughout the history of Mexico. And one of the persons that was most influential in helping further this ideology of mestizaje is Gabriel Figueroa. Gabriel Figueroa was a cinematographer during um, the classic uh, period of Mexican cinema. He filmed over 200 movies. So his images, compositions, photographs, not only help shape um, the, the, the idea of what Mexico would be. He was one of the founding um, people in that. And they actually call him the fourth muralist and they call his movies moving murals. So I think that gives you a sense of the power that his images had. And I wanna quote Benjamin Walter um, who wrote a book called Mythologies. And in this book, he quotes that myths become truth through moving images. So when you have an image, it helps give you an idea that something exists in the world, but when you see it moving, it gives you the sense that not only it exists, it is real and it's not to be questioned. And so I wanna, um, I want to explore the way in which Figueroa in his collaborations with other directors help create a visual connection with the new nation. How did their work and their collaborations result in a nationalism, in a pride of Mexican-ness in Lo Mexicano and how that was visualized. 
And at this time, ideas of liberalism and modernity and progress are intricately linked and that's all, and that all has to do with industrialization and pushing the country into modernity. And all of these values are always at odds with tradition. So we see these um, themes get repeated in Mexican cinema time and time again. Um, and these are just a couple of posters of these films. Most of these are early 1940s, nine, or late 1930s, 1940s, these posters specifically, and they belong to what is not commonly called La Epoca de Oro del Cine Mexicano, or the Golden Age of Mexican Cinema. And I want to point out that this was a term that was not employed or used by the people working in this time period. It was actually a term that was given to this period in retrospect, once production, the number of productions had wound down and Mexican cinema entered a period of, um, of lack of resources. Um, and so to call it the golden age of Mexican cinema is to nostalgize the, the, this period and to think of it in terms of, uh, oh, the way things used to be, you know? And so these are a couple of images of Figueroa's work. Um, these are from four different movies, but you see they have recurring visuals, recurring aesthetic. It's about indigeneity, it's about tradition, it's about folklore. And as I said, Figueroa filmed over 200 films in his career. And this is a quote from a Mexican film critic on the eve of Gabriel Figueroa's death, who said, Figueroa is not only a synonym for Mexican cinema, but with Mexico itself. So he not only helped create a vision of Mexico, he helped export that vision of Mexico to Europe and the United States and all over the world. Um, and uh, Charles Ramirez Berg, a film critic wrote um, of Figueroa's collaborations with Emilio Fernandez, that's Mexico's most Mexican director, um, their collaborations were Mexican cinema's purest, most successfully sustained realization of an authentically native film form. And this is from the book, The Classical Mexican Cinema, The Poetics of the Exceptional Golden Age. So here we see Charles Ramir Ramirez Berg really engaging in the ideologies that Figueroa and Fernandez created with the film. So Mexicans see this film, they see Mexico represented and they love it. They have a sublime moment. They fall in love with the sentimental culture and nation. And this is a connection that really helps, um, you know, foment nationalism. But I wanna give you a different reading of these films and of their work. Um, and this is Seti Higgins who is, has been influential in my work and in my thinking about Mexican cinema. And she says, what the muralists Figueroa and their work represents is a connection to a Mexico that never actually existed. It is a Mexico outside the ebb and flow of socioeconomics and politics, yet one that is vivid in the national imaginary. Even if it did not exist, it is what should have existed, a Mexico to which all should aspire. So she really practiced complicated and critical response to these films in understanding that these films were made in a context, in a time, in a place, and that people had an ideology and that they had, um, they had like uh, their own interests to try and um, get them out to the public. And that really was to create melodramatic didactic films that taught people how to relate to the country and to its citizens, particularly indigenous people. And so indigeneity plays a huge role in this film. This is a screen grabs from Maria Candelaria from 1943, directed by Emilio Fernandez, the director, and uh, cinematography by Gabriel Figueroa. This film won the Cannes Film Festival Grand Prix in 1945 after World War II. So it goes to show you that this film was seen way beyond just Mexico, but was approved by the cultural critics of Europe. And here we see a traditional indigenous mask um, fading slowly into the face of a contemporary indigenous woman. And here we have them side by side. This is in the studio of this man 
artist who is a uh, stand-in for Diego Rivera. We have some Frida ladies up down back here in the background and we see the main character being painted and we see their encounter in this moment where she's coming into town to sell her flowers. He looks at her, he's taken aback by her beauty. He describes her as beautiful as the Aztec princesses when the conquistadors arrive. Um, and then she picks up a coin and he goes out to find her. So in this film, Emilio Fernandez, the director, is really crafting ideas of indigeneity through womanhood. And I think that that is really interesting because it's defining, it's recreating a type of um, encounter. So very much like Cortes and La Malinche and Mexico City and Tenochtitlan, like all of these myths and all of these encounters get recycled sentimentally, that's very important, to create new feelings of, of, of nationalism for the nation. And as we saw, this continues to happen to this day. White Mexican men, artists who engage with, with indigeneity to talk about Mexican society, culture, race, gender, class, and all the other tools of empire. So um, I, we're gonna get into a little bit more, but at first I wanna continue a little bit on um, Figueroa and his place in Mexican visual culture. Figueroa, as we see here, was heavily inspired by the muralists and the modernists. This is a lithograph from um, Clemente Orozco. And Figueroa is physically copying the compositions and utilizing them in his films, creating a dialogue between the fine artists with the popular artists, with the filmmakers of the time. But I wanna push the conversation and his influences beyond the 20th century and go into the 19th century, where we see here images of uh, a flower vendor, indigenous woman, indigenous people um, in, the in the canals of Xochimilco or Santa Rosa. And you see here, this is from an almanac, a printed source. This was highly, widely distributed. So lots of people saw images like this, engravings like this. This was published in a map by Garcia Cubas. This is actually in the Newberry Library. So if you ever want to see it in person, it's like available. Um, and both of these images have a conclusion with the films of Gabriel Figueroa, where millions of people saw them in Mexico City. And um, obviously you have here an image of La Loteria, which is kind of like Mexican bingo, a popular card game in Mexico, where these archetypes and these stereotypes continue beyond the specificity of the film. You know, So this is an idea of a tradition of Mexico that many people have, and it may have been influenced by Maria Candelaria. So it's interesting to see all of these connections. And I wanna give you another connection to the national landscape. This is a landscape painting by the premier landscape painter of Mexico, Jose Maria Velasco from 1875. It's called the Valley of Mexico from the Santa Isabel mountain range. And here we see indigenous and indigenous from the Mexico City, going through the lake, up the hills to their home. And this journey of indigenous people going from the city to their, from the rural to the urban is something that gets repeated also in Maria Candelaria. And I think that's important because it really helps create a dichotomy of rural versus urban, of past versus present. So indigenous people, while they are contemporaneous citizens, are not necessarily modern citizens. And that distinction is made by the use of the picturesque and how they appear to wander traditionally and quote unquote authentically through the landscape. And this really helps create the idea that over here is Mexico City, it's modern, there's train tracks, you see smoke from industry, sorry, smoke from industry. So you know that a lot is happening in the city. And the further you get away from that, it becomes more bucolic and more pastoral and indigenous people's place is exactly there, not in the urban cosmopolitanism of Mexico City. And just like Maria Candelaria, 
these paintings traveled all the way to Paris, to Philadelphia, to Chicago, and they were part of the World Fairs. Like this, uh, some of his paintings came to Chicago in 1893 for the World Fair. So people from all over the world were looking at these images and they were imagining Mexico to be exactly like this. And so um, I wanna talk a little bit more about landscape and these films and connected to Roma, because here we see Pueblerina 1948, Flor Silvestre from 1943, these films are all about the rural. It's about the exaltation and the honesty and the humility of labor and physical work. Um, and these films talk about the countryside as, you know, as, as an honest and mother, you know, it's, a, it's about motherhood and how the land embraces you. But what I think is interesting is that these films were made for city dwellers. Most of these films were screened only in Mexico City and a couple of other of the major urban centers. There were almost no theaters and there continue to be almost no theaters in Mexico outside of the big cities. So I think that there is definitely a creation of a mythos about the nation, about the landscape that's going on. And in Roma, we certainly see scenes of the landscape and of, of rural Mexico. Most of it takes place in the city, but the parts that take place outside of Mexico City are just as important as those that take place within the city. Um, and going back to Maria Candelaria, uh, I want to point out that Mar uh, Dolores del Rio, the actress, was famous in Hollywood before she was a Mexican actress. I mean, she was always Mexican but she was not working in Mexico. Um, she became famous in silent films and transitioned to sound. And she always played um, classy women, uh, uh, sophisticated women. Um, the studios and marketing people always highlighted her, highlighted her Spanish descendancy um, and not so much her Mexican nationality. So I think that that's a very interesting position that when she arrives to Mexico, she engages with the traditional roles and is given the opportunity to try something different. I mean, she was doing exotic roles in Hollywood and she had an accent. So I think like it was difficult for directors to place her in, in films. Um, but it's interesting that once she gets to Mexico, she re-engages with authenticity and with indigeneity. And so Dolores del Rio is not the only actress that is working essentially in brown face. Um, Silvia Pinal, I mean, and these are only a couple of examples, but many other, many, many, many other actors and actresses engaged in these practices. And I think, you know, this is what Silvia Pinal looked like in most of her films. She was blonde, she was very white, uh, fair skin, uh, but when the role called for it, she darkened up. And, you know, this happened time again. Uh, uh, this is a remake of the same story um, where it's an indigenous poor woman working for a rich man and they fall in love. This is like every novella. Um, and so these are not isolated examples. This is something that was the norm. So to have a white Mexican actress play a brown Mexican character was never necessarily a, a big deal. So a lot of people have been seeing this for many, many years. Um, and so no one really blinked an eye. Yeah, you had to you know, do a jump of disbelief, but at the same time you saw it and it made sense in the context of the work. So when we get to Jalite Aparicio, an indigenous woman playing an indigenous woman, the implications of that are very complicated. And we're gonna get into it a little bit more right now. Um, I wanna talk about the auteur. So the auteur is a fancy word for a film director. Um, this was a concept developed in French film criticism in the 1950s. And um, it was written about in Cahiers de Cinema, which is, literally means journals do cinema. Um, and this theory holds that the director is the author of film is the primary voice. And even when there's a screenwriter, authorship always remains with the director. Not every director is an author, according to this theory, but the directors that have their vision accomplished 
are outdoors. And I think this more than anything is a tactic to elevate film and moving images to an art form. Film began as a very popular medium. You just maybe would do a scene and people would mimic what was happening in the scene. And so there was never necessarily given any importance to film as an art form until later on in the 40s and the 50s, where more serious films, more artistic films began to be produced. And I think this was in an attempt to elevate the art form and to essentially push the myth of the artist who is a genius. And so I'm a little critical of this because film is by its very nature, a collective art form. You have got to learn to communicate and collaborate with people in order to work on a film set. So the idea that there's one singular creator and one singular vision, while it makes the work easier, I don't necessarily think that no one else contributes anything. And so I wanna talk about the Three Amigos as auteurs. So this is Alfonso Cuaron, the director of Roma. And these are his best friends. They went to film school together. Well, he didn't go to the film school, but they were in the same circle. So they've been friends since youth and they have experienced unprecedented success beyond the local film industry. And knowing the context of Mexican film industry, you have to know that there's not necessarily a film industry. There might be maybe productions being made, but because of the lack of theaters, there's not really any way to exhibit your films within the country. Streaming is changing that a little bit, but if you want traditional success, you have to take your films to different avenues, like international film festivals in Europe or the United States. And to do that, you have to really make a product that is palpable to uh, foreign audiences. So I think that their example as Mexican men who are directors is very interesting because while they're Mexican men who are directors, their works cannot necessarily merely be labeled as just Mexican film. So I think this complicated web really um, is about transnational, international uh, experiences and markets and directors and partnerships that are necessary in order to make the work that they have made possible. Um, and speaking of world cinema, um, you know, one way to make your work important is to align yourself with the important work that has come before. So this is a 1972 film by one of the most famous Italian filmmakers, Federico Fellini. He made his history of Roma, the city in Italy. And, uh, you know, 30, 40 years later, Cuaron made his version of Roma, which is um, a neighborhood in Mexico City. And so um, I want to keep talking about this idea of the autor and how you um, link yourself to greatness as an artist, right? Um, the relationship between a cinematographer and a director, as we saw with Gabriel Figueroa, is one of the most relationships on a film set, I think. Um, the director is constantly talking with the cinematographer because the cinematographer is helping physically frame, um, compose, light, shoot the image. If you do all the work, but you don't make a movie, right? And so Emmanuel Lubezki, um, the cinematographer that Gabriel Figueroa and the other three or the other two amigos have worked with mostly is an, a Mexican cinematographer. He's probably the most famous cinematographer since Gabriel Figueroa. And between the four of them, they have won countless awards, countless Academy Awards. And so um, in Roma specifically, Emmanuel Lubezki did not work as cinematographer. So Cuaron cemented his position as a genius artist, not only by writing, directing, producing, editing the film, he also did cinematography. So he is literally positioning himself as the director that can do it all. And I think, I mean, okay, he did it. He won an Academy Award before Best Cinematography. That's definitely a feat, but I think, um, that's a concept that maybe we could talk a little bit more about. 
Um, and so moving on into Roma, uh, as I said, having an indigenous woman play an indigenous character as simple as it may seem is actually quite a groundbreaking idea in terms of Mexican pop culture and visual culture. And what I think is interesting here is that Cuaron is injecting her with humanity, with humility. He's really highlighting who she is as a person. And this allows for us to get stuck on this idea of representation of saying, oh yes, we have an indigenous woman championing uh, indigenous representation. But what I think is happening is that at the end of the day, the agency of this character, the actual humanness of the character is lacking. And so what we end up with is not a story about Cleo, it is a story about Cuaron's maid, Cleo. And I think that that is definitely a complicated relationship. And we read in the article that it's like definitely something that a lot of people have been grappling with. But I think at the root of it all is the problem of authenticity. So what does it mean for something to be authentic? What does it mean for something to be so realistic and for you to go out and recreate Mexico City from 1970s to like create this film, right? At the end of the day, like we see everything in the film, it rings true, there's CGI in ways that we don't expect, all for the purpose of authenticity to get us immersed in this story. And that's, I think, a problem that we're gonna keep coming back with this film. Um, I wanna talk again about um, authenticity, nostalgia and sentimentality with this. Um, this moment in the film for me was telling of what's going on in the film, especially with um, the director aligning this moment with a kind of magical moment. And I think that that is problematic in itself because indigenous people have always been seen as magical or surrealist, you know? And time and time again, we have seen this through the work of Frida Kahlo, of the muralist, aligning indigeneity with a type of folk, naive, magical is problematic because as you know from taking this class, the colonial period was extremely violent in terms of what it did to indigenous society. And so, um, something interesting that's happening in Mexico is that we don't know how to deal with our colonial history. And so in our ignorance of the colonial period, you end up with ideas of Mexico Magico or Pueblos Magicos. So uh, Mexico instituted a tourism program, any colonial era town in Mexico has been deemed un pueblo magico, a magical town. And so to equate colonial Mexico with magical is to erase the violence of the colonial period. And I think that that is something that continues to this day. It continues to shape how we see indigenous peoples and indigenous communities and how we see our relationship uh, as Mexicans with each other especially in this intricate web of mestizaje, because mestizaje is supposed to be an equalizing label, except that some mestizos are light skin and some mestizos are dark skin. So there's still definitely an imbalance in that relationship. And so, again, talking about this ideology of authenticity that he went out and recreated Mexico City and created like a perfect production, Yes, it's doable and you can do it when you have US production money and you're being produced with millions of dollars by Netflix, right? And so, again, this is to complicate the conversation on transnational cinema. We have talked a lot here about auteur, history, world cinema, art history, the beautiful production. But in talking about all of these connections, all of these, um, uh, you know, conversations surrounding the production of the film, we forget the ideolog ideological problems at the root of this movie, which is who gets to tell the story 
and ultimately who benefits from the trope of indigenous trauma? And how do our aesthetic formalist um, mastery of the filmic medium help exploit and sentimentalize that trauma? So I think this is something that definitely Sergio de la Mora touched upon in his article. And I think we can definitely keep talking about this. Um, but you know, in talking about the man as an author, as an artist, as a genius who can do it all, who produced a beautiful masterpiece of a film, but what are the problems in the telling of the story? And even Sergio de la Mora says this, is this even his story to tell? Um, and what I think is happening is that, yes, this film began conversations about race and class and gender, but in a simple reckoning, you watch this film, you cry at the end because she saved the kids and she's not necessarily part of the family, but like this reckoning, this guilt, this empathizing that we do changes nothing. It just makes us feel good about feeling bad. And so I think that in order to create deeper conversations, we need to explore our own reactions to moments like those. So this is why I have brought up time and time again, the ideas of sentimentality and authenticity, because they are at the root of our expectations and reactions of these film. Um, and I wanna point to two more specific examples of, in, of the indigenous women around this film. This is Liboria Rodriguez. She is Cuaron's real life maid and the story that is based, uh, and the story that's, and she's the one that the story is based on. And this is from an article from, El Pro, from Proceso, and it's from 2019. And it says, Liboria Rodriguez laughs at everything, just not at Roma. The movie hurts. It touches the most painful part of her life. The first time she saw it, she cried almost the entire time. She saw it as a second time because she could not escape the family commitment, but assures me that she will never see it again, neither in theaters nor on Netflix. And this is her quote. Alfonso tells me that it is difficult and that it's only a movie. Oh, well, okay, I say, we're going to leave it at that. She adds, when she remembers the movie, her eyes get teary. So definitely a little bit of sentimentality in terms of like the journalists talking about this moment. But I think it brings up our, uh, I think what is happening at the root of this film, which is an exploitative relationship that continues even after she has ceased to work as his nanny slash maid, right? So like the relationship of her being his maid was exploitative and unjust and racially charged from the very beginning as it was happening in the 70s. And in a way he felt like it was his story to tell and to take and to craft a masterpiece that won multiple Oscars for himself and that made millions of dollars for a US company. So I think definitely the relationships there are a little complicated and need to be discussed further. And uh, I wanna end with Jalitia's place in Mexican pop culture. So as I said, having an indigenous woman play an indigenous woman, as simple as it may seem, was actually revelation for everybody. All the white Mexican actresses in Mexico who have been trying to break into Hollywood hate her for being herself and for having the success that she had. Um, so I think it's, you know, you have seen many, many, many examples of journalists and TV hosts being racist, making racist comments against her. And it just speaks to what's happening in the relationships in this film. You know, Roma, just like Figueroa's films that went to Cannes and won, uh, won awards in Europe, and just like Velasco's landscape paintings that also went to Europe and the United States and brought um, fame to Mexico, Roma helped position Mexico as a discussant in a global conversation that is simply to put it on the same playing field as Europe and the United States, who are the most powerful players in cultural relevancy. And the way that all of these people, all of these white Mexicans have done this is by utilizing indigenous people and indigenous cultures um, for that purpose. So indigenous people have been used, not always by themselves and sometimes at their expense to help advance the myths 
of Mexican nationalism and Mexican place in a global conversation. And I wanna end with this photograph specifically, which was made for W Magazine. It was directed by Alfonso Cuaron and the photos were by Carlos Somonte, who was a photographer on set of Roma. And they made a photo shoot with Jalizia at the US-Mexico border. Why? I'm not sure. She's not an immigrant. She'd never been to the United States. She'd never crossed the border, but she's indigenous. So at this time, there were kids in cages being held <laughs> by the US government. So most of them are indigenous. So she has literally become a, uh, you know, a face for the broken immigration system. And a lot of that is sentimental and a lot of that is about authenticity. And it really puts her in a vulnerable position that, you know, yeah, it's for W Magazine. Go ahead, get your coins, girl. But at the same time, at what expense? Um, and this is the end of my conversation. Uh, I wanna keep talking about all of these issues. I know I posed a lot of questions and a lot of problems. Um, this is our YouTube channel where we talk about uh, art history. So if you wanna check it out, please check it out. We are still working on Columbus's landing. So all of our videos currently are about um, early print culture in books and engravings. And we wanna get to making a whole series about Mexican cinema, about Frida, about the muralists and the ways that mestizaje as an ideology have been utilized to help create our identity as Mexicans today.